Hi, everyone, and welcome back to our next episode of Rewalks Topics in Neuro Rehabilitation webcast. I'm Jill Butler, and today we'll be talking with co host Kathleen O'Donnell. Kathleen is the Director of Product Management and Strategy at Rewalk Robotics. Prior to joining Rewalk, Kathleen worked at the Wiese Institute for Biologically Inspired Engineering at Harvard University, where she combined her backgrounds in biomedical engineering and design to help lead the development and testing of exosuits, which eventually became our Restore. Kathleen's talk today will integrate some of the research which, which has been presented from our previous talks in this series, and we'll discuss how this research contributed to the motivation and design of the Restore exosuit that we have today. Hi, Kathleen. It's great to talk with you today. Great to be here. Kathleen, we've been do talking about doing this episode for a while because we've had so many fantastic speakers in this series, and it's really interesting to see how their research fits into the design and development of the Restore exosuit. To our viewers, we'd love to hear from you as well. Please feel free to add your questions or comments to the comments section below. And please remember to like and to subscribe to this series if you want to see more talks like this one. And with that, Kathleen, I'll let you take it from here. Great, thank you. All right, thanks, Jill. Um, so as Jill mentioned, we, we've sort of been talking about doing this episode for a little while. Um, and really wanted to kind of pull in some of the insights that we we got from some of the previous episodes and really demonstrate how that led to the, the motivation and the design of the Restore Exosuit. So the Restore Exosuit, for, for some of our viewers who may not know, um, was a product that we launched last summer, so in summer of 2019. And what's really unique about the Exosuit is it, it sort of doesn't fall into the same category as any of the other rehabilitation products out there. So that's why we've spent so much time really helping people to understand what it is and, and what it potentially can do. But just really briefly, the Restore is a soft, it's a fabric-based exosuit. So the main components are all made of fabric. Um, and it's really designed for gait training in a variety of different environments in the clinic, um, doing a variety of different activities. Um, all focused on that really functional task specific gait training goal. Um, it's really intended for use by patients with hemiplegia or hemiparesis due to stroke um, because it really is just one sided. So it goes down and it assists for plantar flexion and dorsiflexion on the paretic side. And this assistance that we're providing is a mechanical assistance. So, differently from FES or some of the other types of stimulation. We're actually mechanically assisting that patient as they lift their ankle um, in plantar flexion and dorsiflexion, and we're synchronizing that assistance based on the patient's own natural gait. So we'll show you some videos in a little bit that shows you what this really looks like, um, but it's really exciting to see it work because it, it adapts along with the patient as they start to change their step length or change their walking speed. Um, you can really see Restore pick right up and, and adjust along with them. So Thinking back to you know, kind of the early days of Restore, when we were starting to really figure out what we were gonna develop and, and what an exosuit was going to assist with, one of the first things we did was really take a look at the, the subtasks of gait. And we saw in Nassim Chadiwala's talk, which was episode two of this series, she really did a nice job of breaking this down in terms of what are those key tasks of gait? And then in particular, what are the tasks that your paretic leg or your the leg that's that's on the ground is really having to do in each of those phases of the gait cycle. So in the early early stance or the weight acceptance phase, your body is trying to keep yourself upright, you're trying to keep the torso upright, and you're not collapsing your knee, you're not falling forward, you're just keeping the body upright. That's that weight acceptance or early stance. As we get into more of the late stance and that propulsion piece, now that job of the product leg becomes trying to push the body forward. So drive the weight of the body forward of that leg so we can transfer onto the other foot. And then now that we've transferred onto that other foot, the job of that product leg is to pick up and then swing forward safely so that we can prepare for that next step. And when we look at you know, all the tools in, in the physical therapist's arsenal, we see that there really isn't a lot to help assist specifically for this phase of propulsion and really propelling the body forward. Uh, and when we really talk about the goal of walking, this is the phase of walking that really 
does that, that moves our body from point A to point B, that pushes the body forward. Everything else is just kind of standing and swinging your leg around, which you need to do in order to get to that next step. Um, but the part that actually pushes your body forward with that leg is that paretic propulsion. Um, so we also looked into, okay, if we know that propulsion is important and we know it's something that we're, we're sort of challenged to address in the clinic, how, how can we think about propulsion? How can that really be generated? Um, and we saw from Mike Lewick in episode eight, he, he did a really nice job of breaking down the two subcomponents of propulsion. So he specifically talked about the ankle plantar flexion or the forces generated at the ankle to really push down into the ground and push the ankle down and drive the body forward. And then he also talked about the importance of the trailing limb angle. Um, so this is the angle that your leg is basically behind your body's center of mass. So how far behind you is that leg when you're doing that ankle plantar flexion? So we put together a quick video just to sort of help everybody understand this a little bit deeper. And so what I'm gonna have all of our viewers do is if you can stand up where you are, um, and what I want you to do is just put your hands on your hips. And the first thing we're going to do is explore that ankle plantar flexion. So if you raise up onto your toes, and so you're plantar flexing your ankles, what I want you to do is feel the direction that your hips are moving. And you're going to notice that your hips are just moving straight up. Because plantar flexion, when your foot is underneath you, is going to move the weight of the body up, but not move the weight of the body forward. So now we're going to try this again. And I'm going to have you take a step forward with your left foot. And now I want you to raise up on the toes of your right foot. And now you're gonna feel that the, when you have your hands on your hips, your hips are actually translating forward as you raise up on your toes. So you can see that it's not just the ankle plantar flexors that matter, but it's also the angle that they are and the angle that your leg is with respect to your body. And then we're gonna do one last experiment. So go back down onto your your full foot on your right foot. And now try to transfer your weight forward onto your left foot without flexing your ankle. And you can see that you can do it. And this is how some of the patients sort of cheat a little bit and try to pull their weight forward, but you're actually pulling forward with your left foot. You're not pushing with your right foot. Um, and, and you'll actually see that this becomes a lot easier if you take a much smaller step with your left foot. It makes it a little bit easier to cheat and pull your body forward. So these are some of the compensations that we see that make up for the fact that we've lost that ability to push the body forward with that paretic foot. So now that we have a better understanding of paretic propulsion, um, we can now start to apply this to what we know about walking post-stroke. Um, and we actually heard about this in a couple of different episodes. So Lou Awad presented this in episode five. Um, and then we also heard again from Mike Lewick in episode eight about this asymmetry that we know occurs in patients post-stroke, that their paretic leg is doing a significantly less amount of work than their non paretic leg in terms of the propulsion of moving their body forward. Um, and this is one of the videos that Lou showed us where this gentleman post-stroke He's actually walking pretty well, um, but what we can see is that there's about an 18 times increase in the amount of work that's being done by his non paretic leg versus his paretic leg. So he's very asymmetric in terms of how much each leg is contributing to his forward propulsion. And we also heard from Lou in that same talk about why this really matters, why we care about propulsion asymmetry is that it really translates and correlates with all of these other metrics that we look at to really see how that affects that patient's you know, community ambulation and quality of life. And that's really what the goal of gait training is, is to get somebody back to their highest level of function and their highest quality of life that they can achieve. And we see that propulsion asymmetry correlates exactly along those same lines as a lot of these other metrics. And not only is this a strong correlation, but there's actually been research which suggests that the therapeutic improvements in paretic propulsion can predict what those therapeutic improvements in six minute walk test distance are. So by improving somebody's paretic propulsion, we can get them back to a higher you know, functional ambulation category. We can get them back to a higher quality of life and a higher 
ability and to reintegrate into their community. Um, so kind of wrapping all this together, we then started looking at well, what is available for ankle dysfunction in the clinic and what is available to train for ankle dysfunction um, with, with patients that have had a stroke. And truthfully, there's really not a lot that trains for plantar flexion. So we do have a lot of really great techniques for bracing the ankle or wrapping the ankle or using FES to help assist with that ground clearance phase and that dorsiflexion phase. But really what's unique about Restore is this ability to also apply assistance in that plantar flexion and propulsion phase and start to retrain not just the muscles to, to push off, but the timing of when they should be pushing off. Um, so I'm going to get into this in a little bit, but just giving you a quick shot at what Restore looks like. Um, it's worn around the waist and the calf of the paretic leg. And then it's applying assistance to an insole in the shoe, and it's pulling up both in plantar flexion and dorsiflexion uh, to assist the patient in those two phases of the gait cycle. And when you're using Restore, you can operate it in three different modes. So the first one, which is the most common, is the assist mode. And this is when both sides of the cables are active. And so again, the anterior cable is going to pull during dorsiflexion, the posterior cable is going to pull during plantar flexion, and that's going to give us that ground clearance and forward propulsion. And we have sensors on each shoe that are used to synchronize that timing of assistance with that patient's gait cycle so that as they change speed or direction, it automatically keeps up. The Restore also has what's called brace mode. And this is really, it's really a great transitional mode um, for getting around or, or kind of navigating different environments, the cables are actually fixed in a locked position and you can customize that position that they are locked in. Um, but it, it basically holds the ankle in a constant position, very similar to an AFO or a brace. And then the last mode that we see used a lot is slack mode. Um, and this is a really nice way to essentially remove the assistance from restore without having to physically remove restore. So it can be a really great way to do, you know, either a baseline assessment or pre-post assessment. Um, and we also heard Francino Porchincula talk about in episode 13, how they're using this for that intermittent assistance that they're doing. Um, so that was a really cool way to see them using Slack mode as well. Um, and again, so Lula Wad had a second episode with us where, um, which I think was episode 11, um, where he also talked about some of the data behind exosuits and, and some of the research that we worked on together to, to really understand what an exosuit could do. Um, so some of the things that he mentioned that were highlighted in the research were you know, the demonstration of improved forward propulsion symmetry, um, the reduction of the metabolic burden associated with post-stroke walking, the improvement in dorsiflexion angle during swing phase with, with post-stroke participants. Um, and then one of the other papers that we published really looked at the reductions in these compensatory behaviors. So specifically reductions in hip hiking and reductions in circumduction um, when patients walked with the exosuit. And then one other study that Lou didn't mention um, was really one that we did that looked at EMG muscle activity um, and really looked at how walking with an exosuit affected that muscle activity. Um, and what was demonstrated was that the, the patients who are walking who had you know, appropriate timing of plantar flexion and dorsiflexion, we actually really didn't see any voluntary reduction in that muscle activity. So the patients are doing um, the muscle activity with and without the suit, um, but the suit is really acting as almost a booster on top of that to kind of guide them in the right direction to guide them in the right uh, movement strategies and guide them in the right timing, but it doesn't necessarily allow them to slack off and, and kind of take a break when they're walking. It kind of forces them to keep using their muscles that they're using. So one of the other studies that Lou touched upon in episode 11 was the clinical trial that we ran in conjunction with a lot of the other um, major clinics around the US. So I just wanted to quickly touch on this as well. Um, in terms of what this study was, was really designed to demonstrate safety for the FDA. Um, and that's really how it was powered and how it was designed. 
but we did throw in a few exploratory results as well. Um, and so in particular, there were certain results that we collected in terms of that immediate improvement with Restore. Um, and these were really things that we saw in terms of how they could change the, what the treatment session looked like itself. So what type of therapy are we delivering in the treatment session? Um, and some of the things that we found there were, you know, first of all, that the, the duration of gait training activities increased when we used the Restore. Um, so essentially patients had up to 40 minutes to train with Restore. And as they progressed through the study, the amount of that training um, became a, a higher and higher percentage of those 40 minutes. We also saw that the average walking speed in Restore improved by about 0.1 meters per second for the group average, um, so walking with the device. Um, and then we also did a two-minute walk test to, to look at how far those patients could walk within a given amount of time. Um, and we saw that you know, when we turned the suit on and we had it in assist mode, we saw a group average increase of 47.9 feet compared to when those same subjects walked without the assistance from the suit. Um, so these three together kind of demonstrate that within these sessions, they're walking for longer durations of time, um, they're walking at faster walking speeds, and they're walking for longer distances within each of those sessions. Um, we also did some pre and post assessments, and Lou specifically talked about these as well. Um, but in general, we saw you know, the majority of patients improved their comfortable and maximal walking speeds independently of the device following these five gait training sessions with Restore. We also heard from Francino Porcincula in episode 13, where he really described this first case study that they did, looking at you know, some of the more therapeutic effects of exosuit-assisted training. Um, in particular, they had an individual with chronic stroke who participated in these two different bouts of uh, gait training therapy. And these two bouts were essentially the same, except that one of the bouts was conducted with an exosuit and the other was conducted with usual care or conventional training. Um, and what's really unique to me about these results is, you know, although there were some kind of modest increases in terms of the walking speed and walking distance with the usual care training, they're, they're significantly more impactful when we look at the changes that were achieved with the exosuit augmented training. Um, but I think even more, more exciting or more relevant than that is looking at how the, the individual was able to achieve those changes. And so when we look at the changes in paretic propulsion, we see that with the exosuit augmented training, there was a 10.5% increase in paretic propulsion, meaning that the individual started walking with a more propulsion-based walking strategy. And then when we look at the usual care training, even though we saw a couple you know, modest increases in speed and distance, there was actually a decrease in paretic propulsion, meaning that these changes were achieved through some other strategy that wasn't propulsion based. So likely some sort of compensation um, in order to get to these particular changes. So this is, this is really exciting. And I think we're gonna see a lot more um, from these research groups about you know, how we can actually use this therapeutically. Looking at the components of the Restore, we have um, a couple of different components, but starting at the waist, we have a waist pack, which is where the motors and electronics are housed. Um, and then that's connected through a series of cables to a calf wrap, which is a fabric-based sleeve that's worn over the patient's calf. Um, and that's put on top of a liner, which is sort of like a prosthetics liner um, that just used, is used to protect the patient's skin. And then those cables continue on down to an insole that's worn inside the patient's shoe. And then we have some sensors that clip onto the outside of the patient's shoe for motion detection, which is how we actually synchronize. Um, and then one last component of the device is a lateral support strap, which is really an optional component, but it was based on the need that we saw for a subset of patients which really benefit from having that ad additional medial lateral stability to help prevent that ankle inversion uh, during dorsiflexion. So this is just a passive strap which runs down the outside of the leg um, and helps give a little bit more stability in the medial lateral direction. Um, and then 
one of the things that's been really cool seeing this project progress from really a research prototype all the way up through a commercial product is really the usability of it. So, you know, in our early prototypes, it was somebody at a laptop, you know, typing in, you know, coding new, new commands to, to change the device. Um, what's really exciting about Restore is that it has a therapist app that's very easy to adjust the settings and, and manipulate so that we can really always customize to each individual patient. Uh, so this is really the main screen that you can see. You have the real-time readout of the stance time ratio. Um, and we heard from a couple of our therapists. Um, in particular, we had you know Kristen Cole from episode four talking about how she was using this to actually help um, guide her patients to really try to drive for better symmetry. And then also on the screen, you have the assist, the slack, and the brace modes, and you can just use that to toggle between those three different modes of function. When you go to assist, or when you go to edit the assist mode, you can, you can actually edit the dorsiflexion and plantar flexion independently, and you can slide the assistance levels up and down um, pretty much in real time. So something that we've also seen therapists do is have the patients walking on a treadmill and adjust the levels of assistance. You can kind of automatically see how that's going to affect the way that they're walking. And then we also wanted to build in some of the more standardized tests. So there's a built in two minute walk test, six minute walk test and 10 meter walk test that you can use to collect these data for, for your reference as you're going through the session. And then at the end of each session, you get a little bit of a readout. So you can see how many steps that patient took in each mode. You can see any of the tests that you ran. And you can also see previous sessions. So you can compare how this session compared to the previous sessions. So as I mentioned, we launched Restore last summer. Uh, and we're starting to see, you know, we're starting to get feedback from customers around the world. Um, and it's really exciting to see some of the different ways that different clinics are using it. Um, also really exciting to see some of the different equipment that they're using in conjunction with Restore. So one of the ways things I really love to see is when clinics really figure out how to integrate Restore with a lot of the other techniques and equipment and other things that they're doing uh, in their facilities. So we've seen it with, uh, you know, body weight support. We've seen it with using the gate belt as a, as a PT handle. Um, you know, we've seen a lot of really cool, you know, ways to use Restore. And one of the customers that we had um, put together a little bit of a, an opinion paper on it. And it was really nice to see and really nice to read through this because it really echoes a lot of what we're seeing in the, in the more laboratory-based research, but they are also seeing this in the clinic that, you know, for them, primarily what they're seeing is that patients are walking longer distances within their given stroke uh, rehabilitation sessions. So they're, they had one particular individual who normally did you know, four or five walks in the whole session. And by using Restore, they were able to pretty much double the amount of walk-ins they were able to get into that particular session. Um, so it's nice to see that, that echoing what we're seeing in the research as well. Um, we have a couple of videos here just to show you again what Restore looks like on patients. Um, so this is an individual, she's about six weeks post-stroke. Um, and if you look on the left-hand side, you can see, you know, a, a number of different deficits that we want to target. But, but in particular, I think she's having trouble with that step initiation and timing. Um, and we can also see that she's, she's really relying on both of those therapists in terms of her balance and support. And then when we look over to when we're in assist mode and we're actually assisting her with plantar flexion and dorsiflexion, um, I think, you know, there's a, there, again, there's, there's a couple of things that we can notice, but that consistency, that reciprocal gait is, is really improved. Um, her overall confidence is improved. But what I really look at is her step placement and timing is, is much uh, improved over her baseline condition. Um, and then we also can look at that second therapist, and that second therapist is doing a significantly less amount of work um, and probably isn't necessarily needed as much anymore for that support and that balance that she was providing in the slack mode. Um, so that potentially speaks to, you know, can we get fewer therapists assisting, um, you know, do we really need a two-person assist for, for this individual now that we have Restore? Um, we also have a couple of videos. This is an inpatient clinic. 
Um, and this individual was uh, actually using cardiac monitoring during this session. So it allowed us to sort of get some more insights into um, what he was doing on a physiological level. Um, but if we look again at his baseline condition, uh, the biggest thing to notice is that, you know, that plantar flexion is, is essentially absent in this individual. So he's, rather than pushing off the ground, he's actually just lifting his foot up and then bringing it forward. Um, so he's doing a lot of that kind of cheating that we talked about, um, as well as just inconsistent ground clearance and heel strike angle, um, you know, difficulty with the timing and motor control. And what really this leads to is just that slow speed and limited number of steps per session. And this was reflected in his heart rate that he was not able to achieve really that desired, you know, intensity level that we would want to see to, to achieve, in, you know, that neuroplasticity and the improved locomotor outcomes. And what we can see when we turn restore on in assist mode is we're actually getting a heel strike angle. Um, and we're seeing more of that push off action um, where he's actually rolling up onto his toes. Um, so we're actually getting a little bit more of a functional push off. Um, but again, it's that timing and motor pat patterns that are we're getting more of a reciprocal gait. Um, and this kind of plays out in terms of his speed, the number of steps per minute, the distance that he travels. And again, because he was hooked up to cardiac monitoring, we can see this reflected that he was actually in this session, and these are the same session, but in this portion of the session, he was able to achieve those intensity levels that the therapist was recommending. Um, so it was really exciting to see, you know, this was his first session with Restore and he obviously responded fairly well to it um, in terms of what it was able to do for him within that session. So just to quickly wrap up, you know, these were a lot of the design goals that we had going into Restore of trying to make something that, that was really um, gonna kind of check all the boxes in terms of what, what really could be beneficial in this, this population. And I would say the biggest one here that was really drove the, the development of Restore was, was focusing on finding a way to train for plantar flexion and train for that propulsion symmetry. Um, but in doing so, we wanted to still make sure that we had something that would rapidly and automatically change to patient's gait as the patients continue to, to change and evolve, um, would allow that that true freedom of movement so that we could practice perhaps non-gait exercises with Restore as well um, and rapidly transition between different modes so that again, we're not just doing Restore gait training the entire session, but we can sort of mix it up and do, do a lot of different things within that session um, that all kind of contribute to, to each other. Um, one of the things we didn't talk about so much was this the supplemental support aids, but we did see a few images of Restore being used with overhead support. Um, we can also see uh, images of it being used with canes or walkers. Um, so really as, as needed, you can add in supplemental support aids to really assist the patient based on what their level of function is. Um, and we've also been really excited to see a lot of different activities being done with Restore. So, um, you can do, you know, like a circuit of sidestepping and forwards walking and, and people are, are getting really creative with how they're integrating Restore into their clinical practice. Uh, and that's really exciting to see because that's, that's definitely the goal is to, to make something that, that fits with what you guys are already doing. Um, and then just really more on the technical side, you know, it's very easy to adjust the assistance. You can measure the assistance, you can replicate the assistance. Um, and then at the end of the day, you're going to have you know, a readout of what are the assessments that you ran and, and what are the number of steps and what did you accomplish with each session. Um, so that's pretty much the summary for Restore. Um, thank you so much for your time and I look forward to your questions. Thanks Kathleen for a great summary and introduction to the Restore exosuit. It really is so interesting to see how so many of the concepts presented in previous talks came together to motivate the design and development of the Restore. I'm sure our viewers will have a lot of more questions for you, but we'll start here with just a few. All right, so first question. Can you talk a little bit more about the sensors on the Restore and what it means when you say that the Restore automatically synchronizes to the patient's natural gait? Absolutely, and it's a great question. So there's a couple different sensors on Restore. We have motion sensors, which are clipped to each shoe. And then we also have force sensors, which are at the end of each cable. Um, and so all of those are continuously running as the patient is walking. 
um, the force sensors are really just adjusting the how hard the cables are cables are pulling to to match what is input by the therapist. So um, they, they make adjustments kind of as the patient's walking. But the motion sensors are tracking the way that the patient is moving. Um, and it's it's allowing us to pick up on kind of basically the gait events on each foot. So we can have you know heel strikes and toe ops detected not just on the product side, but also on the non-product side. And so based on that information, I know not just is the foot you know, on the ground or off the ground, but I actually know kind of where are we in the gait cycle. And so what I'm trying to do is synchronize to um, essentially when the plantar flexors should be turning on. Um, so we actually heard from Nassim Chadiwala in episode 14, where she's talking about how the plantar flexors actually turn on pretty early because they're eccentrically kind of slowing us down and then they fire to, to pull our heel up. And so where they're starting to, to kick in is as our weight starts shifting in front of our foot. So as our weight starts shifting, if we can detect that, that's when the plantar flexors are gonna come on and assist you with the rest of that motion. And then for, for ground clearance, as that toe comes off the ground, that's when we're gonna wanna put in that, that dorsiflexion to lift the toe up and clear the ground. So when we say that the restore is synchronized to the patient's mo movement or motion, uh, what we really mean is we just don't pre-program anything. So we don't say, okay, you're gonna take steps every you know, half a second and you're gonna take this long of a step length. And all of that is determined by the patient. And as the patient starts to you know, either change on their own or if they're cued to take a longer step with their non predic leg or if they're cued to start walking faster, the restore automatically detects that and then just keeps up along with them. Um, so that's that's really what we mean when we say that it's synchronized. Perfect, thank you. All right, next question here. One of the questions that I hear a lot from therapists is asking if there's any studies that have been done comparing training with the restore to other modalities such as maybe FES or an AFO. Can you comment on the current state of research here? Uh, absolutely. And I guess the short answer is no, that research hasn't been done. But I think the longer answer is really, um, you know, when we're, when we're making these comparisons, I think the first thing we need to do is figure out what is it that we're trying to compare. So are we comparing the, the therapeutic benefits of these different devices? Um, or are we looking at, you know, what are the potential long-term assistive device you know, functionalities of these. And since Restore isn't an assistive device, it's a therapeutic device, um, it's really hard to compare with an AFO because we're sort of comparing apples to oranges. Um, so, you know, an AFO is a really great compensatory tool that assists that patient in their everyday life. Um, but I think we all know that an AFO isn't going to make them better at walking without an AFO. Um, and so, so those are, those are sort of not even unfair comparisons, we're just talking about two different things. Um, when we're looking at FES, um, you know, I think that they're, again, I think it's actually a very complementary therapy to Restore um, in that both of them are, are trying to improve that patient's walking um, without getting in the patient's way. Um, but I think, again, where the difference is, is really looking at what are the functions that FES can assist with and then what are the functions that Restore can assist with. Um, and again, it's not all one or the other. I think they're very complementary tools. Um, but when we look at it, we, we have demonstrated and, and some of the research we've done has demonstrated that Restore does improve ground clearance, does improve dorsiflexion angle, which is what we're trying to achieve with FES. Um, to flip that around, we also have demonstrated that we've improved that propulsion symmetry which isn't really a target for FES. We aren't able to target plantar flexion with any of the commercial FES systems. So there's really nothing to compare against there in terms of what we're able to achieve um, because that's really just not, not one of the things that we, we are targeting with FES. It's really just a different category of a therapeutic device and there's nothing that, that would really make sense to compare against it. You mentioned the different modes of operation for Restore, Slack, Assist, and Brace modes. Can you talk through it in a bit more detail about how you are seeing each of those modes being utilized in clinical practice? Absolutely. Um, and that's one of the things that's really cool about Restore is you can, you can switch back and forth between these modes 
you know, many times within the session. So oftentimes we'll actually see all three used at different points within a single session. Um, you know, I think assist mode is probably the most obvious. So that is is assisting during walking. Um, and we'll we'll see therapists either playing around with you know, reducing the amount of assistance within a session or increasing the challenge of the activity within a session using the assist mode. Um, so again, we heard from Francino Porchincula um, in episode 13, where he talked about how they increased the complexity of the task. Um, they, they kind of progressed the complexity of the task. And we see that a lot. Um, we also see them in, in that same study, we also saw them using the slack mode as what they called intermittent assistance. Um, so this is where they, they train for a particular task with the assistance on, and then they either reduce the amount of assistance or take it away completely, and they have the patient try to repeat that task um, using what they learned in assist mode, but try to replicate it on their own. And this is a really cool way to tap into motor learning and tap into neuroplasticity um, that, that really works between the two modes simultaneously. Uh, and then we also see Slack mode used um, more as an assessment tool. So to see kind of a patient's baseline or even mid-session to just check and see how much has been kind of learned or absorbed. And then at the end of the session, again, to see, you know, what has actually been retained. Um, and so it's a really nice, easy way to do an assessment without having to physically remove the restore device. And then brace mode sort of was really intended to be more of a transitional mode. Um, so for patients that are you know, stepping up onto a treadmill or have to, to navigate some sort of a, a weird narrow situation to get to the track or to get to where they're going, um, that was really the intent behind brace mode. We've actually also seen it used, um, I would say a bit more creatively in terms of ways to evaluate how a patient will do with different types of brace. Um, so because you can manipulate how much tension you have on each cable, you can sort of simulate what it would look like to, if we cut the, the plantar flexion stop, or if we cut something else, we can simulate those different types of braces, and then we can see how a patient would do with, with different conditions. So that one's a little bit more creative, but it's, it's cool to see therapists coming up with these really different ways to use all the different functionalities of the restore device. Great. And lastly, for any of our viewers who would like to learn more about the development of the Restore Exosuit or would like to see a Restore demo in person, what resources would you recommend for them? Great question. Um, and I think, you know, the, the short, easy answer is you can always visit the Rewalk website. Um, there's a whole page about the Restore. Um, we actually also have a contact page. So if you want to reach out to us to request a demo or you want to reach out to us to, to do an in-service at your facility, uh, feel free to use that page. We'll include a link in the video description below as well. Um, but that's really the best way to get in touch with us. Uh, in terms of learning more about the development, um, I actually did a TED talk about a year, two years ago. Um, so we'll actually include a link to that as well, um, which really talks through sort of the early stages of development and, and how we got to where we are today. Uh, and then also I would say a lot of the other speakers that we've had in this series have all been sort of interacting all the way along uh, through the development process. So I would definitely encourage viewers to check out some of these other episodes if you haven't seen them uh, to really get a feel for, for what, what went into the development of the Restore Exosuit. Well, thanks for a great talk, Kathleen, and thank you so much for your time. Thanks for having me. And to our viewers, we hope you've been finding these talks interesting and helpful. When we started this series, we originally planned for it to just run through the summer, but we've been having so much fun with it that we decided to continue it on as a monthly series. So please make sure to like and subscribe to the video using the buttons below, and feel free also to use the comment section to add any questions or suggest future talks or speakers. We hope that you tune in again with us next time. Take care, everyone. Bye.